Okay, you can again. Yeah. So welcome to the final payment wings of the year. Uh, the end of next month will coincide with Christmas. And so quite a lot of people will be off on holiday. And although uh, glacial climates might fit with Christmas and the concept of snow, uh, I don't think people necessarily want to come along to meetings. So we won't be holding one. Uh, at the end of December. So this is going to be the last one of the year. Uh, and instead of thinking about glacial climates and cold climates, we are today uh, thinking about the last interglacial. And we've got a pair of speakers uh, lined up. And so we're going to start off with uh, Louise Syme, who is over at the British Antarctic Survey and has been there quite some time, actually. Although I'm not sure how long, but it's been it's been a while to establish herself quite seriously uh, within the community, and so she's going to tell us about the last some of her results from the last interglacial. And so the way I'm seeing this working is that we're going to have the presentation of some science from the from one of the last the the Lig one two seven K simulations from PMIP4, and then Christian's going to come in in the second half of the session and start thinking about where we might be going in, in the next version of PMIP for the last, in, or for interglacials. And so let me pass over to you, Louise. Thank you, Chris, uh, uh, for the nice introduction. I try and share my screen, and yeah, I'm glad you also didn't say how long uh, I've been at Bass for. Long enough to become entirely institutionalized, probably. Maybe that's all they need to do. Um, okay. So if we press play, does that do something? Nope. Uh, it's not in presentation mode, is it? No, it, it, it is. It is. Oh, it is now. It is now. It's just slow. Okay. Good. All right. Thank you. Um. Yes. Uh. So I will, exactly as uh, on the tin, talk about Arctic sea ice during the last interglacial. I thought a subtitle was progress through the puddle. Probably a more formal title would be something to do with melt ponds, but uh, ponds, puddles, whatever you want to call them. Um, so I, I think a nice place to start for this is, is, is looking at the last interglacial records from, from Greenland. But partly because they're um, well dated. So it means we can say something about um, how long the leg lasted and what it looked like generally uh, over, over the last interglacial. So the, the, the last interglacial certainly encompasses uh, this period shown here of peak warmth in the, the Greenland ice cores, which started about 127,000 years ago and went to about 120,000 years ago. So that's a period where the O18 in the ice cores was very clearly above um, pre-industrial values. So we're sure it was definitely warmer. Um, and it looks possibly, certainly the Neem core, that it was reasonably stable for some of that time. But it's not just the Greenland ice cores that, that show that it was warmer. Um, there's much more widespread evidence. So. Uh, uh, originally, most of this data set was brought together by the CAPE members quite some time ago and then sort of updated by Betty uh, and for IPCC AR6 and then again by Vittoria uh, uh, for 2020. And what this data set shows is the available peak uh, summer time uh, air surface temperatures uh, from the available terrestrial, the Crucian, marine and ice core uh, data points, all, all 21 of them. So if you take the site mean of those relative to the pre-industrial, then it suggests that the Arctic was about 4.5 degrees warmer than the, the last interglacial. And up until relatively recently, our paleoclimate simulations didn't really capture that. So there's this question of why. Um, what I'm going to argue is that we, we do know fairly conclusively now why and it's really quite simple in essence so at the last interglacial um 127,000 years ago given that's a PMIP um, standard time that we use for our time slice experiments the the insulation anomaly in the, the high north was up to about 70 watts per square meter 
in the spring or early summer. And if you impose that insulation anomaly on a pre-industrial climate, then you have a catastrophic loss of sea ice. That tends to happen, I think, in all models. And in this particular model, which is had GEM3, the UK CMIP6 model, then within four years of imposing this, then you have an ice-free Arctic, which is defined as having less than one million uh, square kilometres of ice in summer. You can see from the spin-up block that over the 30 years you're having uh, spin up, so warming of the, the ocean as well. And then by the time you've reached a more stable last interglacial simulation, this particular model always has an ice free um, summer and relatively low sea ice through uh, the intermediate seasons as well, too. When you look at the output from those models and you test the models and you test it against available terrestrial summertime air temperature observations at step 21, then you find that if you take account of the uncertainties, then an ice-free summer in HUD Gem 3 gives you really quite a good match with the geographical pattern and the overall magnitude of the warming. If you try and do that with a model here, which has an ice present summer, then you don't get a good match. That was a, that was pretty much what we published in 2020. And that was essentially at that point, the, the evidence that we had for um, the, the, the loss of summertime Arctic sea ice. Of course, that simulation is just one of several. So the last interglacial protocol really doesn't have, um, this is just, I'm sure everyone knows it, but just to remind you of what it actually is. So it really doesn't have a strong difference in the greenhouse gases compared with the pre-industrial. It's only a, a, a difference of about 10 parts uh, per million, so 275 rather than 284. So all that normally is really down to the insulate, or all the drivers are really down to do with the insulation forcing or the, the big ones. So in Betty's much nicer plot of the insulation anomalies, it looks like this. But again, it's just the same point that you have this huge insulation anomaly uh, in um, here. It's in effectively May, June. We actually have about 16 to 17 simulations run uh, for a PMET for uh, of that this last interglacial time slice, 127,000 years ago. Um, it, you can argue about how many exactly are independent of each other, but we basically have quite a, a good set of simulations to look at this. And Betty published in 2021 uh, a lot of nice results from that. So you can see here that all of them have a much warmer, so plot A in the, the top, I don't know, I should try and make sure I've got a pointer. Hang on, if I can make a pointer. Does that work? Is that visible? I can see you, Chris, yeah, yeah. So like up here, um, you can see that there's really quite intense warming for most of the, the models for the summertime. But you can also see that the standard deviation associated with, with that summertime warming is really quite big. Um, and actually it's even bigger in the, the winter, but we, we won't talk so much about that for now. Um, so, there's this huge range of um, mean annual temperatures simulated. Uh, so these are the normalities and mean annual temperature between the pre-industrial and the last interglacial. And I would argue that almost all that disagreement between the models, the ma vast majority actually is really down to the, the sea ice in them. Um, most of the models simulate the pre-industrial sea ice or, or the present day not too bad. The, the plot on here shows that relative to the, the sea ice edge, the observed sea ice edge, this is again a nice plot from Betty's paper, most of them, um, 16 or 17 or so of the models are basically relatively close to this line. But again, when you come to the last interglacial, which is the bottom row here, there's a lot more difference between them. So mostly acceptable-ish mean state for the pre-industrial, not all of them. Um, and sometimes the, the, the seasonal distribution is a bit wonky, but um, but it's not terrible. But this is what it looks like uh, on the models uh, for the last interglacial. So you can see there's really quite a big difference. We, I've, we've shown here for the last interglacial, the, um, the uh, cumulative uh, distribution uh, of the I've taken the axis off this, of, of, yeah, for the sea ice area. So you can see that actually some of them, at least occasionally, so 
these ones are actually sea ice free on some years. The rest uh, all have a really big loss in sea ice compared with the pre-industrial, so they all reliably show less sea ice, but they show quite a lot of difference in terms of um, the details of that. So of the three which are sea ice free, um, these two have quite a good simulation for the pre-industrial and for the present day. I'll kind of use those interchangeably when we're, we're talking about whether they, they work for the present day or not. Um, and both of them use the same um, sea ice scheme uh, with explicit melt ponds in size uh, 5.1. <laughs> so it's quite noticeable that the, the models which are sea ice free have the same um, explicit melt pond sea ice scheme. Um, we can also more broadly use the, the, the set of simulations alongside the, the set of site summertime air temperature observations to try and say something more broadly about the likely sea ice loss. If you do this in a not very uh, sophisticated way, where you effectively look at the mean station um, average site warming in the different models. Here's all the different models here. Then if you pick out where you have a match in the, the mean temperature, then that would suggest that you, you, you're going to have a reduction of around about 4.2 kilometers, 4.2 million kilometers. That would actually give you a small amount of um, remnant sea ice, uh, which would be about 1.3 million kilometers. So maybe say 1 to 1.5 uh, million is maybe actually the best answer rather than no sea ice at all. But if you had some Something around that you'd have pro almost definitely a mixture of technically sea ice summers we had less than one million square kilometers and some summers we also had more than that but the average would be one to 1.5 billion square kilometers if you do that you also can work out what the most likely arctic warming is too and actually um there's a bit of a bias in where the temperature observations sit so the, the mean Arctic wide warming is actually probably more like uh, 3.7, which is a bit lower than the, the site mean warming. Um, but back to the, the, the main, main thing that I wanted to talk about, which is actually the, the melt ponds. So Rachel Diamond has done really a lot of good, uh, amazing work in this in the last years, um, uh, following up on what Victoria did earlier. So I'll just show you the very, the very sort of main results uh, and if she's here maybe she can talk to you more about it if she wants to um but it, in essence it's really quite simple what's going on for for had gem three uh, it's a really simple story and uh, we think probably also for tcsm so because of that big springtime insulation anomaly so much more sunshine in the spring you start having the formation of melt ponds in their explicit melt pond scheme much earlier. So this is showing the melt pond area here. So here it's going up earlier than in the pre-industrial. It peaks higher than in the pre-industrial as well earlier. And then the reason it starts to drop away here earlier is simply that there's no sea ice left. So you can't have melt ponds if there's no sea ice. So it is really this simple, like radiative forcing, earlier melt onset, albedo feedbacks, which are key in this explicit scheme, a uh, higher rate of sum summer sea ice melt and hence complete summertime loss. Um, and that's, yeah, that's what we published in 2020, but then Rachel's really looked at this in, in detail in the last two publications. So why I sometimes call them puddles is that this is what we're talking about. We're talking about puddles, really. I, I think they're puddles rather than ponds, but um, on top of the sea ice. So these are growing in spring, uh, and then um, because they're darker, you're uh, absorbing more radiation and you're having a rapid uh, melt of the sea ice. Um, I can't remember if this was the last main thing I wanted to, to say. But one of the really nice things that Rachel's just, just got published just now is a, a, a test of how important these melt pond physics really are during both past and future warm climates. So I think it hasn't been necessarily clear to people pre previously whether it mattered if you had explicit melt ponds. And the reason for that is shown here. Um, so what Rachel did was to run the same simulations uh, three times. The first time with the explicit melt ponds switched on, which is called scheme E here. 
then with an implicit form, which a lot of models have. So they effectively attempt to take account of the albedo feedbacks, but not, but using a, I'm just going to call it a less sophisticated scheme um, where there's no explicit accounting for the melt ponds. And then, then a, a third run, which is more like the explicit melt pond scheme version, but with the ponds switched off, so no, no melt ponds. And if you run those three versions with the implicit scheme um, kind of tuned as closely as it can be to match the explicit scheme, then it really doesn't matter very much for the pre-industrial which version you take. The sea ice doesn't care very much. So she's run 100 years here, and you can see that between those three simulations, they all have a relatively similar um, minimum sea ice um, extent in this case. And this is one of the reasons I think people were not sure how much this mattered. But if you run it for either the last interglacial or for a near future run, in this case, it was actually a repeat of 2014 um, uh, over and over, then it really does begin to matter. So if you use implicit scheme for the last interglacial, you actually still occasionally get ice free years um, or possibly more than occasionally, but you certainly get a much higher mean sea ice state here. If you use the, the scheme with the melt pond switched off, again, you have, get, have quite a different answer. And you can see for the future what's going on here as well in terms of them not just um, separating, but also diverging through time. Um, Rachel looked at this quite closely and what she effectively showed that this is mostly to do with how thick the sea ice is. So if you have relatively thick sea ice for the pre-industrial, then the, the model, the climate doesn't care too much which one of these schemes you pick, which physics you include or you don't include. But when you go to a, a, a state where you've got less sea ice, thinner sea ice, and here the, the, the ongoing loss of sea ice, then these simulations do quite different things because it really matters when you have thin ice. So the more thin ice you have, like effectively, the more important it is to have explicit melt ponds. So um, I did a, uh, yeah. So so I guess for me this is really useful because it it's a really good example, at least in my view, of how we can well how at least something that we discovered by looking at the lap into glacial simulations has significant ramifications for either your parameterization or your scheme choice for what you should be doing for future. So you can actually tune or choose your scheme based on whether or not your, your model gets a, a sea ice free um, arctic for your last interglacial and say therefore whether your scheme is more or less appropriate for um, a warm climate in the future. Um, I think maybe this was the last thing. So this this is a, a paper that was published by Flora van Massen, which is really nice, um, this year as well. And this was uh, just to say that we really do think that see it, like this works because what they did was to publish a brand new data set, which is based on this, uh, I'm gonna mispronounce this, sorry for any biologist, T. Quinquilova, possibly, sorry to biologist. Um, so that, that that lives where there's no sea ice for the present day. And then in their last interglacial course, they've got it all the way up into the high Arctic. So this is really brand new evidence, which um, supports the fact that you had to have like really low sea ice state and probably sea ice free summers, at least some of the time for the last interglacial. So whilst previously we were a bit stuck with uh, using mostly the, the air surface temperatures. Now we've got both the, the summer air temperatures for the Arctic and we've got this evidence as well too, which is really nice indeed. Okay, <laughs> um, I will briefly go through this uh, just because I, I do think like we've gone, we've come quite a long way in the last like 10 years on this. So, so what we've learned in the last uh, 10 years or so um, about climate models and about climate. 
So whilst we knew the Arctic was much warmer back in 2013, we already had this 4.5 degree warming back then. Then we, it was postulated that it was due to lack of physics, vegetation physics and feedbacks in the models. And it wasn't until sort of 2018 where we first found that you could actually explain that 018, the, the water isotopes in the Greenland ice cores, potentially by nice free summer, that um, we kind of... Uh, started thinking a bit more about that but it was really more serendipitous than 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 anything that when we just so happened to set up the UK team at six model and ran it for the last interglacial that we found that it was sea ice free and it it really got quite close to the the observed um uh, or the proxy based uh, arctic warming that there was uh and that's really what got us started down looking at this in detail um I was just going to say here, effectively, now we've got much more data, which is really nice. So we're much more confident about what we can say about the last interglacial um, from a variety of data sets. Uh, we do know, uh, because of lots of very careful work done by Rachel and a bit by David Jodeur, uh, with sport as well, that it really is the melt pond physics that are are are. Uh, enabling um, the melt of the sea ice. And we've done that because of all the sensitivity experiments where we switch things on and off and we test everything. So we know that for sure. We have used this as an opportunity to learn quite a lot more about the melt pond physics and how important they are for future projections. Um, yes. I think someone might need to turn their microphone off. Um, I'm not sure if I can mute whoever it is. I've tried muting someone. Maybe that works. Um, yeah. Um, although I would argue that despite all of that, actually, we haven't really tested what, what the impact of dynamic vegetations are. Uh, so it would be a good idea to also look more closely at that as well, uh, not just the milk pond uh, and the sea ice physics. So for anyone that was far too long, <laughs> then summer was warmer during the last interglacial and we were either sea ice free or, or near sea ice free generally. Um, Arctic sea ice change really does seem to be key to understanding the climate of the Arctic during the lake. If your sea ice is wrong, probably your climate is wrong. Um, and also if you're gonna use that to do ice sheet model simulations, that's something to genuinely worry about. So uh, you need to get your sea ice uh, change is right or else everything else isn't right and uh, in terms of the physics melt ponds and sea ice are really important warm climates and we can show that from from our uh, last interview um, and that apparently was 20 minutes so um i'll stop there although i had a couple of slides to also um take us into Christian's talk, but maybe I'll talk, stop there first at my 20 minutes and uh, and then if I'm allowed to, I'll show the last two slides after that. Yeah, why don't we pause there? And and the way I think I'm going to work this is that, that we'll, or so people can ask specific questions in the chat now and you can respond to those. And then we'll have Christian's talk, and then the aim is to have a bit of a discussion at the end, and so save qu questions relating to both talks to the end. But if there's any specific bits, then I'm more than happy for people to type them in the chat and move on like that. And so I can see Christian's already got his presentation up on the screen, so uh, I will pass over to Christian, uh, who's over at Arwe, and he's going to talk about uh, sort of moving, looking forwards, at how we look backwards in the future, but so sort of talking about the next, the next load of uh, simulations and the results from some of the survey he's been doing. So I'll pass over to you if that's okay, Christian. Yes, <clears throat> thanks very much. Can you hear me? <clears throat> yes, I can. Good. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm not good with this zooming. Uh, does anyone know how to get rid of this one here, or it doesn't disturb anyone? I can't even see it. Okay, then perfect. Okay, good. Sorry, sorry. Then only I see. That's perfect. Good. Um, there were some controls over the the the, the plot, but it's only only uh, for me. Yeah, thanks a lot um, for for the opportunity to to present some um, thoughts from Louise and myself and uh, people who are involved in shaping the um, 
next round for uh, interglacial simulations for PMIP and uh, CMIP. Um, <clears throat> so after these very interesting results by Louise, I would like to rather give a bit more a technical point of view, namely um, what, what are our ideas and plans? <clears throat> and these ideas and plans are just at the moment being drafted, so nothing is, is, is set in stone. Um, uh, your, in, your input is very, very welcome. And I will start this off with some um, results uh, from the PMIP Interglacials Community Survey that we started in August this year, where we asked the community what is their idea of what, what interglacial um, um, simulations should contribute to science-wise in the next round of uh, the model in the comparison, and also what kind of models they would like to use and to propose. Um, and a lot of people have contributed to this. So first of all, thanks a lot to everyone who uh, answered to that community survey. Um, it's still open. You can still answer to it. And uh, your input is, is uh, uh, welcome uh, for the time uh, continuing, no problem at all. We take everything into account that, uh, that comes until we set up the protocol, of course. Um, so the outline is um, uh, shortly some results, as I said, from the community survey. Then I will reflect a bit on the ideas of simulations that we have. I will give a few notes on uh, what PMIP integrations will look like within CMIP and uh, CMIP Fast Track. Um, in the run up to this talk, um, uh, Chris already spoke about this. And um, then our tentative timeline, and it's very, very tentative because IPCC has not announced yet its own deadlines. Um, and then my last uh, point would be invitation for contributions from the community. Everyone who is interested in science, uh, last interglacial, other interglacials, and uh, modeling this data. So to the community survey. <clears throat> so as I said, we have this survey. It's still ongoing. Um, uh, there were 33 responses up today. And um, I think very interesting results came out of that that um, help us to shape uh, the, the prot protocol for the next round of interglacials uh, simulations in, in, in PMIP. And uh, first of all, um, if I now focus on the modeling side, because first I want to talk about the, the models that are proposed for the next round, there are up uh, in the order of uh, 20 models being proposed. Uh, not all of them are uh, completely independent from each other. Some of them are identical except for resolutions or different um, versions of it. Uh, but um, we are in the order of 20 models that we could expect, hopefully, for the next round. And that is uh, a bit more than what we had so far. Maybe we will get more uh, throughout the, the in the comparison. We will see. Um, and of those respondents uh, that answered to this uh, uh, survey, there were 78% indeed uh, uh, modeling people. And 22% were people who are more interested in the data that we produce. This just as a background. Um, and these models that have uh, diverse model capabilities, so we can expect a lot of uh, different capabilities uh, in the next round of PMIP than what we had through, uh, through PMIP 4. First of all, dynamic vegetation. I think there were a few models in, in PMIP 4 that were able to use dynamic vegetation. According to the responses we got uh, so far from, from the community, it's now uh, the majority, the vast majority, so 80% apparently can apply dynamic vegetation in their models. And that will help us a bit also to further uh, research the effect of dynamic vegetation for warm Arctic inter interglacials, as Luis already stated. <clears throat> then um, some of the models, about 30%, can also use dynamic ice sheets. How relevant this is for interglacials, uh, in, in, in PMIP interglacials is a different question, but there is some potential for example, to make sensitivity studies or to uh, connect with other MIPS who focus more on ice sheets. Then um, what is very nice for comparing directly to proxy data, uh, about a third of the models is also able to uh, simulate stable water isotopes. So while these are normally computationally heavy, so maybe not every simulation will be run with that, um, it looks like we could expect some simulations that produce also stable water isotope output for model data comparison. Then, uh, yeah, the focus um, in the past has always been on the physical models with a bit of dynamics, but uh, there is of course much more biology in in the uh, in the um, climate system, and uh, it looks like also nearly 
50% could in principle apply dynamic biogeochemistry. But of course, one has to see whether one finds a way to sensibly employ this in a, in a model data comparison and in, a, in, a, in the protocol for the simulations, because often you need a long spin-up to do. Then some things that are also of relevance for, for feedbacks and for the dynamics in specific parts of the climate system is the dust cycle. There's, uh, I think, two or three models who could dynamically simulate that in the future. And uh, there's also one model that could look into details of carbon isotopes. So um, that might not necessarily be relevant for a model in the comparison if you have only one model, but this is just to give you an overview of the uh, com com uh, uh, capabilities of the models that will uh, potentially be used in, in the next round of PNIP interglacials. So we to summarize this, the majority can do dynamic vegetation, which might be helpful to further explore the dynamics uh, and various feedbacks in the high latitudes. Uh, and then we have some other um, components in the models that can be used for dedicated sensitivity studies, potentially. Uh, in addition, um, so the vast majority of, of models is now able to simulate uh, or to prescribe changes in freshwater. Land sea mass topography, ice sheets, or vegetation fixed if they do not uh, dynamically simulate it. Um, and the majority is also able to change volcanic aerosols and dust. So all these kind of uh, forcing changes could be meaningfully applied then in, in the next round to, to illustrate the sensitivities of the models to various different forcings. Simulization, uh, we also asked whether the, the modeling centers think they will be able to summarize the output in a meaningful amount of time. And about 60% of the respondents said they will be able to do that. So we have to think then how to cater for the other 40% if we want to let them take part in the modeling in the comparison. But maybe not all the data will be available on ESGF because it must be summarized to that end. So the, 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 the main simulations in, in PMIP4 were equilibrium simulations. So LRG 127K and metholocene was uh, spun up to an equilibrium state, and then you made some uh, analysis on that. Whereas we had then some uh, sensitivity studies with different ice sheets, different orbital forcings, and also um, a suggestion for two transient simulations. And so... The, the, the daily bread of PMIP was equilibrium simulations according to the modeling protocol, but we also wanted to know what people actually are interested in analyzing uh, simulation-wise. So this is not necessarily only an answer from those who um, produce the model simulations, but also those people who just are interested in the data and would like to use it for their own science. And what was a bit surprising to me is that indeed the transient simulations seem to be very sought after. Uh, so it's uh, about uh, same. It's, it's the same amount of uh, interest for first choice uh, of of simulations, uh, namely equilibrium and and transient simulations. And uh, just to explain this shortly, so first choice just means we gave people the option to rank the importance of their simulations. So first choice means this here is the most relevant for for this amount of people, and then um, we have here a second choice and third choice. So first choice is very focused on equilibrium, but also on transient simulations. Then second choice is sensitivity studies to uh, identify, for example, different importance of uh, various uh, boundary conditions and forcings. And um, so we have a very diverse um, interest in, in, in with respect to the type of simulations that PMIP might produce. Of course, transient simulations always have a bit of a higher uh, workload on the modeling centers and, and computational load than the equilibrium uh, simulation. So one has to think how much of this one can actually realize within a model in the comparison protocol. But at least the interest for transient simulations is certainly there. Um, we also asked what are the scientific questions that uh, the community would like to answer with the simulations produced in the next round of PMIP in the glacials. And it's quite diverse. Um, this is only a very small snapshot of, of what has been proposed um, so model data disagreement that is obvious um, is, is one question and uh, yeah, uh, um, I highlighted two, two um, of those um, answers read because they somehow show the limits of the ensemble that we had proposed, the simulation ensemble that we had uh, uh, proposed in PMIP4. 
So the first question that somehow might open our horizon to, to further parts of the um, quaternary dangerous mythology in, in last interglacial is that the question how warm were actually these past interglacials and what determines that differing strengths? And we had uh, 6K and 127K, uh, but the question is whether you can meaningfully answer these kind of questions with just two time slices. And in particular, how do interglacials compare to each other and to the future? So there maybe one gets the feeling a bit more um, um, time slices than just uh, two Nemi Mythologine and last neglation might make sense in the future. Um, and I already mentioned uh, the, the, the survey is still open. If you have wishes, proposals, ideas, you can always uh, submit them. Good. I already mentioned that uh, the 6K and 127K might not necessarily be sufficient to answer all these questions. So let me uh, roughly give a few ideas on the, um, um, the, uh, the, the simulation portfolio that we might come up with for the next round of uh, the MIP. Um, so if we look over the whole glacial, in the glacial um, um, cycles uh, for the um, quaternary, then um, we have, we already see that, that there has been a trend and we had uh, various uh, different uh, pronunciations of glacial in the glacial intensity. But as I already mentioned, so the last interglacial um, and the mitholocene were the only ones that were really sampled. Uh, and yeah, this is just the uh, two newest ones and certainly is not the full answer to all the interglacials that we had over the last 2.8 million years or so. Um, to look a bit at what was the focus for the uh, PMIP4 simulations from the interglacial point of view, so the focus was heavily orbit. So everything was um, from the tier one simulations, at least everything was modern, except for greenhouse gases in the orbit. And we had the focus on two different orbital time scales. So 6K uh, here, uh, time slices 6K and 127K. They have a difference in forcing, um, but um, yeah, we will see how representative this is or not. And then there were some sensitivity studies uh, for, for different, uh, boundary conditions, namely freshwater forcing or different orbital forcing. And then we had two transient simulations. And our idea at the moment, but nothing is, as I said, carved in stone is probably to keep the 6K and the 127K as it is, because it has the advantage that we could track model development over time, um, that the impact of model development on, on the modeling results, if we change any of those simulations, of course, this will be hindered. Um, um, but yeah, we are open, of course, if, if, if somebody comes up with a very important reason why specific changes should be applied, and we could do this at least in some sensitivity studies. Um, the sensitivity studies that were there, uh, we are thinking whether we keep them as they are or potentially adapt them in the next PMIP round. But all this is work in progress. I already mentioned that we had just looked into the last part of this interglacial uh, cycle um, um, uh, uh, series of cycles of the uh, quaternary. And um, there is, of course, much more. So if we just focus again on the orbit and keeping in mind that, of course, also other things are different, uh, land, sea masks, ice sheets, uh, orbital forcing is only one of this, then uh, we see that um, there are a few uh, time slices that might be interesting from an orbital point of view because the uh, forcing is a bit different. One of these is the MIS 11C, where we had a very strong interglacial despite a rather weak uh, orbital forcing. Um, but it was a long one as well. It was a long um, interglacial. And then there's, uh, for example, this MIS 31, which could be maybe considered a super interglacial because it had an even stronger um, summer insulation forcing that the last interglacial had. So these are some potential candidates that we could propose uh, for, for additional time slices in the next round of PMIP if we figure out a, a sensible modeling protocol and, and make sure that uh, the workload is not too much. So it's not about that everyone has to run everything, but we could at least offer some of these simulations as higher tiers, for example, that we open up the science a bit more towards earlier interglacials than just the two most recent ones. And uh, just a note towards this MIS 11Z, because MIS 11Z will probably not be our own um, 
yeah, creation of a modeling protocol. So uh, in the Quix um, community, there has been recently this um, proposal of a MIS-11, uh, see uh, modeling in the comparison. And this is led by Shushang and colleagues. And this is a slide by him that just shows once more what are differences between these uh, uh, three interglacials that one could look at them, so 6K, 127K, and MIS-11C. And um, this, um, th 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 this group of people is uh, now making a modeling protocol. So we could suggest to just take over some of their simulations that are compatible with our approach in PVP interglacials and, and, and offer these as an additional model setup in the hope that then more people will get attracted to these simulations and produce but that we get a larger uh, model ensemble. Good, then so much for ideas for simulations. Um, a few notes on, on the structure of CMIP and, and uh, how PMIP interglacials will be able to contribute to that. Um, there's a new uh, topic uh, with respect to CMIP, this is CMIP fast track, and I will shortly talk about this. Um, if you're interested in details, there is another drop-in information session today. Um, in case you saw this email, you could uh, go this evening and get more information. But the rough idea of CMIP fast track is basically that it supplements the um, uh, community MIPS and DEC uh, work uh, within CMIP. And in the past, uh, the whole CMIP and PMIP procedure and the various MIPS procedure was like this. We had these DEC experiments that basically build the core of the CMIP work, and then around this, you build your community MIPS. Um, and ideally, the idea was, of course, that by the time when the IPCC creates its uh, stock take and, and, and uh, literature review, this work should be ideally finished. Um, and it was uh, found that uh, it's a bit of a much workload if, if, if everything that is done in these various MIPS must be squeezed into the timeline. And so CMIP came up with an idea that we'll have a fast track where a sub-selection of time-critical simulations will be executed. And the rest of work in the various MIPS is then completely independent. And the MIPS can actually decide on their own timelines, uh, except for those simulations that get into the CMIP fast track. So in principle, PMIP will in the future not be bound by specific timelines. Of course, uh, if we want to have our simulations reflect into the IPCC, report, then it would still make sense to follow that. But this is just to outline what changed potentially between the last round and the next round. And we have discussed, so Maya, Ma, Ma, um, Masa Kageyama, Chris Briley, Luis, uh, Simon, myself, we have proposed uh, that the last in the glacial becomes one of those semi fast track simulations in a slightly modified form. So numerically less expensive than what we would need in the full CMIP simulation. And uh, the idea is that we would then hopefully have more models that produce uh, such a last neglectual simulation that we get a wider model ensemble to, for example, study this impact of uh, uh, orbital forcing on sea ice and whether the models are able to reproduce this or whether there are processes in the models that are not uh, able to um, produce these feedbacks that are necessary to get the ice-free uh, ocean in the last interglacial. Um, this is not yet clear whether this will happen. So there are now discussions and consultations and end of March, uh, it will become clear which is the semi fast track ensemble and whether our uh, proposal for an adapted LIG 127K simulation will be part of that. Tentative timeline. Um, so very tentative because uh, as I said, the timeline of the IPCC itself is not set. But we are roughly now here, so it's a bit complex, but I walk you through the most important parts. And in the moment, we are informally exchanging with the community, for example, via the um, survey, what kind of work we would like to propose for the next round. And uh, we have now some ideas, we are in some discussions, and early next year, we should start in to design a protocol. We have a bit of time for all this because uh, actually the timelines for historical forcings, for data requests, for scenario forcings, and for the time when the CMIP fast track earliest should be finished. It's still a few years, so people that are still developing the models have a bit more time. But yeah, we we hope we come up then with, with a modeling protocol throughout the next year. 
And we plan sometime in, 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 in the mid of next year, maybe May, June, July, we will see uh, that time uh, period, uh, an interglacial science workshop where we bring together people who would like to uh, contribute to the modeling protocol so that we then have, have a firm idea what uh, the simulations for PIMP interglacials should look like uh, then for the next round of the model in the comparison. Uh, last step. I already mentioned, uh, so we are very much uh, happy for contributions from you, for comments, criticism, and uh, any kind of ideas what could be added. Um, so we are building now at the moment a team uh, of, of uh, people, of contributors who uh, set up this whole um, um, modeling protocol and, and provide data that is necessary for model data comparison and for providing the boundary conditions. And um, this list is by far not complete. At the moment, we are um, setting up subgroups that focus on specific topics. So we will have one that is the modeling subgroup where all the modelers end there, then science subgroup, interglacial ice sheets, um, because interglacial ice sheets are, of course, one of the important things that are not so well constrained, where we need more information how the topography should have looked like during the various interglacials. And um, yeah, we need uh, paleo data and we need uh, then the group that provides model setup on protocols. And this is also not complete. So we are still setting up our whole uh, work environment. So this, uh, this, uh, this structure might become adapted. But important is, so if you did not yet express your interest via the um, survey to, to uh, become part of this and you're interested in contributing and you see yourself in one of those groups, please contact us. And then we can, yeah, try to bring the next round of the model in the comparison on track and to hopefully an, uh, a successful um, yeah, end as the last round. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Christian. That was great. And whilst you were talking, uh, there has been stuff going on in the chat and my personal contribution has been to share a link to the survey. So if you're interested in any of these expert groups, do go and fill in that survey and provide your details so Christian can come and talk to you. We have... Um, I will just stop the recording. Is it okay? Yeah, please do.